to a 103 or whatever. Uh, at, well, actually, um, we don't do it. Uh, so we take this Zoom and then we, um, I don't know what he's doing, but we're playing it on YouTube. So we won't see the 103 people. We won't see how many are there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But Allison will tell us afterwards. Oh, we're live. So okay. here we go. Here we go. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us in the second of two forums to help us celebrate poetry, poets, and writers during this month of April. If you missed our first session with Gail Mazur, reading a selection of her poems and discussing them with Megan Marshall, I hope you'll take a moment to watch it on our YouTube channel. We have so much material to cover tonight, Jay, that I hope you'll forgive me if I summarize your biography and describing you as someone who contains multitudes, a poet, novelist, professor at Middlebury College, as well as biographer of John Steinbeck, William Faulkner, and Gore Vidal. There's a synchronicity to this moment for Jay and I met 20 years ago when I was in my first months working at the Kennedy Library, and I organized a forum um, on Jay's biography of Robert Frost. It was a lovely spring afternoon, and as I know you to be each time uh, I've heard you speak, Jay, you were funny, engaging, and generous in your remarks. Uh, but I also recall how lucky I felt on my daily commute on the T, the weeks building up to the event that I had recently landed a job where someone was paying me to read wonderful books like yours and then organize conversations with their authors. And here I am still at it, still pinching myself. And I should note how much I recently enjoyed rereading the Frost biography and reading for the first time your new memoir, Borges and Me, An Encounter, a memoir the New York Times described as a delicious treat, which brings Borges more sharply to life than any account ever written. And maybe at the end, we'll have a moment to talk about that. But thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Um, thank you, Tom. Set up this lovely collection of poetry for kids where you quote Robert Frost as saying, a poem should begin in delight and end in wisdom. And it's always a delight to be with you. And I sense our viewers will leave this evening the wiser for it. So, I'm going to make an assumption that our uh, Concord-centric viewers here this evening know, know more about Emerson and Thoreau's lives than they do about Frost. So we might talk biographically a little more about Frost, but we will talk about Emerson and uh, Thoreau. Uh, but uh, I thought we'd wend our way somewhat through Frost's life uh, and Emerson and Thoreau's influence on Frost's writing. Um, but I'll, I'll say until I participated in an event earlier this year with you, Jay, I had not realized what an influence Emerson had been about Frost. And I thought we should maybe start there. You write um, in this lovely, um, an essay in this book, Some Necessary Angels, the importance of Emerson to Frost can hardly be overstated. The latter's poetry represents a continuing dialogue with his great predecessor. So talk a little bit about that dialogue between Emerson and Frost. Well, it's important to remember, Tom, that Emerson was um, founder of what Harold Bloom, the great Yale critic, calls the American religion. And um, when Frost was coming of age, starting to write poetry in the 1890s, um, Emerson would have been a really dominant force, especially for a, a young writer working in, in New England. Um, he was living at the time in Derry, New Hampshire, which is probably, you know, very short, as you, today it's a very short drive to Boston and not that far from Concord. So, um, Frost was a great reader and he would have been, and I, and I happen to know from his own letters and notebooks and things that he was a very close reader of Emerson. But even if you didn't know that, you could just read the Frost poems and you feel the presence of Emerson. I always felt the presence of Ralph Waldo Emerson in the poems of Frost. It's, it's his attitude to nature is everything. Frost um, always thought that the most important book in many ways that he ever read was Nature by Emerson, which is an 1836 book, which I consider like the touchstone for American poetry in the 19th century, even the 20th century. Um, it's, it's essentially uh, the touchstone book for the transcendentalist movement. Transcendentalism unfolds from nature, 1836. And essentially Emerson is arguing that um, where do we find truth? but in the self, and the self is rooted in nature. Um, for, uh, Emerson's sister was furious with him after it was published. She said, I'm so sick of your, um, uh, what did she call them? Irreligious, atheistic books and writing. 
And so, but and the thing is, in the 19th century, the idea was you would go back to the Bible, back to God, to get close to God, get back to any transcendental uh, feelings. Uh, Emerson pulled away from the traditional church. He resigned from his uh, ministerial spot in Boston. And he began reading in the book of nature to find God or to find a spiritual life. A frost was raised um, by, his, by his mother, basically. And she was um, a Swedenborgian, right? Swedenborgian. Frost went to a Swedenborgian church in Massachusetts. I don't even think there are Swedenborgian churches around except- I think there's one in Cambridge on Memorial Ave. Right, they're, they're, Memorial they're, they're, they're far and few between, but they were pretty, uh, there were a lot of them in say 18, 1890 or 1900. And, and the Swe Emanuel Swedenborg was this, you know, 17th century Swedish mystic who talked about the correspondences between the natural world and the spiritual world. Um, and so Frost educated in this Swedenborgian philosophy, religion, uh, really did look at the natural world defined as Emerson says, emblems of the spirit, right? Every natural fact becomes a sign of some spiritual fact. So if you see a bird or a tree or a rock or a cloud, it's somehow reflecting some deep spiritual landscape. And so inner and outer start to blend. Um, em Emerson moved closer and closer in his, in his writing toward a kind of non-dualistic philosophy, which means you're not seeing so much as inner and outer, but you're letting those things blend. And so uh, I think in, in Frost, it's never, he's never a specifically religious author, but Frost finds spirit in nature. And uh, he was once asked by Rabbi Reichert, whom I interviewed when I was writing my biography of Frost, you know, maybe 30 years ago, I interviewed Reichert. He said, Frost said to me, I'm an Old Testament Christian. And <laughs> so, um, but Frost never went to church. He said he went to church in the woods. And that's straight out of Emerson. Emerson in Nature writes, you know, where do you go to church? You go to church in the woods, the cathedral of the trees. And he said, there's nothing that in the woods is not any, 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 any feelings of guilt, any past sins, any troubles, any, any problems, everything dissolves when you get in the woods. And, and Frost, of course, has a bit of a darker vision than Emerson. Emerson's pretty high, bright, spirited, <clears throat> cheerful in some ways, even though his own life was pretty rough, he stayed fairly cheerful. Frost has a dark side to him, as you know from the poems, right? <clears throat> These woods are dark and deep, right? But I, the woods are lovely, yes, but they're dark and deep. And I have promises to keep miles to go before I sleep, miles to go before I sleep. So, so there's this yearning, the distance. I mean, the, the stopping by the woods on a snowy evening is just one of the many poems where Frost is really contemplating him, man alone in nature uh, against the dark backdrop and against eternity of a certain kind. In your biography, you use the example of nothing gold can stay. It's another one that has that Emersonian move in it. Oh yeah, that, that, that's one of the most beautiful little lyrics ever written, but nothing gold can say. Nature's first green is gold, um, but, it's, but it fades away. Everything in life disappears. Uh, but Frost is, I always tell my students at Middlebury, uh, the poet of the seasons. And mm -hmm. um, any poet of the seasons, like Frost was a, a farmer and he was wedded to the natural round. He knew that, you know, yes, you go through winter, and he's a great poet of winter. An old man's winter night is one of my favorite poems of Frost. The old man in his cabin, it's freezing outside, the man is dying. But we move through winter and, and, and snows and all this stuff and ice, but we move into the beautiful spring pools and uh, <clears throat> you know so many lovely spring poems where we see that the nat nature, uh, the, the story nature tells us is that whatever dies uh, is reborn. And I think that's the that's the transcendental of transcendentalist move that Frost got from his reading of Emerson. I was intrigued in one of your essays, though, that you 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 make sure that Emerson is in caricature just as an optimist, and as you mentioned, tragedy in his own life. But um, I like this quote of his. You said he showed a healthy degree of skepticism towards the end of his life. And let me read the quote. This is Emerson's words. The ground occupied by the skeptic is the vestibule of the temple. 
society does not like to have any breath, breath of question blown on the existing order, but the interrogation of custom at all points is an inevitable state in the growth of every superior mind. Um, this is why Emerson gets in trouble when he gives his lectures at Harvard, because he so questions the kind of current order. Yeah, that Divinity School address at Harvard, he, he really questioned um, revealed religion and, and, and the customs of religion more than anything. He wanted to withdraw from the conventional church. He wanted to, con he wanted to get rid of his robes and go out in the, into the world and talk to actual people and, and walk in the woods. And he wanted to find his spiritual life there. Um, yeah, amazing. And also, it's interesting to, to parallel Frost and Emerson in what they did for their lives. Both of them were men who cut themselves off from traditional sources of authority, the church or, or, or academic life. I mean, Frost had some connection to a college, although all along, a bit of Amherst, a bit of Middlebury, a bit of, you know, here and there. He was poet in residence, but he was very loosely attached to any academic setting. And, they, and both Emerson and Frost kind of made their living as public men. Frost gave thousands of readings in his life. He kind of pioneered the public reading and he was great. I mean, to hear Frost read would have been one of the great uh, joys of, of anyone's life. I never heard him because he died before I was old enough to really experience that. But um, I've seen a million, <laughs> I've heard him on tapes, you know what I mean? Right, right. I've listened to so many tapes of him reading and seen the movies, and, I mean, the. Uh, videos of him reading. But Emerson, my God, he gave, I was just reading, he gave 1,500 plus lectures uh -huh. in the course yeah. of his life, yeah. 1,500 plus. And he made his living, a good living, out of being a public lecturer. Uh, I'm going to bring Thoreau in, in, in a moment. But um, in that, after that quote where you talk about Emerson's skepticism, you say that what Frost adds to the conversation is a quality of ironic humor that Emerson lacked. That, tell us a little bit about what you mean by that. Well, Emerson didn't have, I, I think one thing he lacked was a sense of humor. I don't, I don't see it anywhere in Emerson. But right. Frost, you know, Frost was that skeptical mind, right? His father was a real skeptic, an atheist and a skeptic. And, we, and so Frost always combines the mother, Bell Moody Frost's, uh, you know, airy-fairy spiritualism, Swedenborgianism, with his father's harsh skeptical side father, the Harvard man, the journalist. And so Frost, you know, there's a, a, a strong urge toward, there's almost an astringent quality in a lot of his poems, right? One could do worse than be a swinger of birches, even in birches, that tone, you see? Right. Uh, good fences make good neighbors. You know, there's a lot in Frost, aphoristic skepticism, but you know, you especially see it in, you know, in poems like, you know, better to go down dignified with bought and friendship at your side than none at all. Provide, provide. The poem, poem is called Provide, Provide. And there's no more cynical poem in the English language than Provide, Provide. Uh, all right, well, let's throw Thoreau into the mix. So uh, I enjoyed reading your chapter in this book, Promised Land, 13 books that changed America. And you list Walden as one of those 13 books that kind of shaped our character. Tell us why, maybe just so quickly, the premise of that book and why Walden made the list. Well, because Walden is, first of all, it's one of the great American autobiographies. And autobiography slash memoir is the core genre of all American great writing. I mean, going back to Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, uh, right up to the present. I mean, it's a constant it's a constant in our, in our intellectual culture. And because the autobiography is the story of the, of the creation of the individual self, especially in opposition to society. And, and that's, I mean, we see the ferocious independence of Ben Franklin, of course. But when we get to Thoreau, I mean, he sets off, it's a very self-consciously woven piece of auto-fiction, Walden. He sets off um, on, on Independence Day, quite self-consciously, 1845, and he sets off for Walden Pond. And he wants to declare his own independence from anybody else. I mean, there's no more individualistic um, person than Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau was, that, that's frankly what led to the problems in the friendship. Uh, Thoreau was having none of it most of the time, whatever it was, he was having none of it. Uh, 
He was a very independent-minded, ornery. I mean, he could probably never have gotten married. He remained a bachelor till he died. I think he could not yield enough of himself to other people. He was a man who went off by himself in Walden Pond. By the way, he, he was squatting on land, building right. on land, <laughs> loan, on loan from Ralph Waldo Emerson <laughs> with, with his great money he made from lecturing. Um, Emerson bought a lot of land on Walden Pond. And he said that yeah, his young protege, Henry David Thoreau, go ahead, um, you, can, you can have a bit of it and build yourself a little cabin. And, uh, and so Thoreau did. And the premise of Walden Pond is he goes off there and stays through the seasons and he learns how to commune with nature and with himself. And he declares his own independence. And it's a great spiritual autobiography. It's a, I mean, there's nothing quite like it. You, you describe him as a genuine prophet in the book as a perpetual fountain of linguistic youth, which never loses its freshness and remains as important today as it was on its first day of publication. Mm -hmm. Why don't we talk a little bit about Emerson and Thoreau's uh, friendship. And um, I had noted too that for this, um, uh, you write Thoreau defines American independence, but he was dependent on Emerson, as you noted, living on his land, but also intellectually, and we've already talked about the book Nature, but talk a little bit about maybe Thoreau's, um, what he inherits from Emerson, and then a little bit about their friendship. Well, I don't think you could have got Emerson, you couldn't have, have had Thoreau with his philosophy of nature without his um, deep, deep, deep friendship and reading of, um, of Ralph Waldo Emerson. I mean, he was a student at Harvard. He was just on a spring break in what, 1837, when he comes in, and, and he's introduced to Emerson by Emerson's sister-in-law. And, and he goes in, 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 in preparation for this meeting, um, Thoreau actually sat down and read through um, um, Nature, 1836, published the year before to great acclaim. So he went prepared, he did his homework, and Emerson was impressed. This young boy, 14 years younger, has done his homework. And uh, you know, their conversation began and kind of never ended, but certainly in the early decade of their friendship uh, from 1837 uh, up through the time at Walden Pond, um, you couldn't get, uh, you couldn't have had Thoreau shaping the ideas that he shaped without Emerson. I mean, Emerson was the great Kantian, Immanuel Kant, the idea of idealistic vision of the world and how we get to know things, the theory of knowledge, which was in very severe contrast to the more dominant Lockean view of the world, which is that we get to know the world through our senses and we put it all together. Um, no, the, 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 um, the Kantian can look inside and, 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 and inside find the ideals of the world and make connections between inner and outer. And, and this makes the transcendental uh, spirit possible. And so I think that it was the abstract thinking of Ralph Waldo Emerson in all of his great essays, essays for a series, second series, um, beautiful essays like, of course, the book Nature, but essays such as Circles, which is one of the greatest pieces of writing that ever, ever happened. And, and his essay, The Poet, about the American poet, uh, his essay on self-reliance, which is, of course, cr crucial. It could have been written by Thoreau. But, you know, all of these ideas transferred back to Thoreau, who puts them in his own, in many ways, Thoreau is a better writer of English on some level. It's more concrete, more poetic. Um, Emerson is always a little abstract, um, a little hard to follow sometimes, um, much more aphoristic. Emerson is very, very quotable, but the sentences are often little atoms that don't necessarily connect to the other atoms in the paragraph. And so you can, you can drive yourself a little mad reading Emerson. Um, I love reading him and I'm so excited by reading him. I get so excited. But nevertheless, I'm aware of the fact that it's, he, his, his unit of discovery in language is the sentence. Whereas Thoreau is much more of a poet in his prose and is able to build, as he does in Walden, a more complex picture in language and also able to generate a bit of a narrative, which Emerson couldn't do to save his life. I always thought Emerson was also a pretty terrible poet. Thoreau wasn't much of a poet either, but he's a, in his prose writing, he's a great, great poet. I hope our viewers don't mind us shifting centuries, but 
Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about Frost and then how uh, Thoreau and uh, Emerson um, influenced him. So tell us a little bit, you, you already began about, um, again, I think people know that Frost was born in San Francisco. His family moves back to Massachusetts when his father dies. He has not much success at college. He marries. And then tell us about those critical early years that you call formative in Derry, New Hampshire. He's married with his wife, Eleanor, living on a farm raising chickens and his three children. Just tell us a little bit about the poetry, the, what, what happens in that moment in his life that's so important. Well, I would tell people, I mean, the curious thing about Frost is that he's born and raised in San Francisco in the city. Right. His, father, his father's a journalist and his father dies and Frost is brought on a train, uh, tragic circumstances with his sister and his mother back to Lawrence, Massachusetts, where his grandfather runs a big factory and has a bit of money. And so the, uh, the grandparents are going to look after, look after the Frost family. And then Frost, who's a very bright boy, very brilliant boy, uh, graduates first in his class and, and he shares the valedictory honors with his wife-to-be, Eleanor. They're mm -hmm. married pretty soon after graduation. Frost does a little bit of education at Dartmouth, six weeks. Dartmouth makes, I used to teach at Dartmouth, they make so much of Frost having been a student there. I hate to point out to them that he was there for six weeks and he hated it. And, uh, and then um, he went off to Harvard for a little bit, two and a half years. And then he dropped out and he said, schools and I just don't get along. That was his famous phrase. And so then he went to become a, his grandfather set him up at his own Frost's own request as a chicken farmer in Derry, New Hampshire with his young children, four children, and his wife, and he really is a farmer there. And so in the 1890s, right up until 1910, he's working as a chicken farmer. In fact, his first poems were published, not in Poetry Magazine, but in Poultry Magazine. <laughs> I've always loved that fact. And, and he wrote some of his, uh, many ways he wrote many of the, his greatest poems, the poems of, uh, he didn't really publish poems until he was almost 40 years old when he went to England. It took him, it took going to England to find his audience. Uh, but he, he wrote many of his greatest poems, you know, Mending Wall, all these poems, Death of a Hired Man. Uh, so many of the great early poems, uh, even the great poems are written before he was well known. And, and so he, he, he in one fell swoop publishes his first two books, A Boy's Will and North of Boston. And, um, and then he never looked back. He came back to New Hampshire after three years in England in 1915, war had broken out. He had to come back. And he sets up on another farm up in um, Northern New England and he farms there for a while and writes a lot of poetry. And he becomes very popular and goes giving poetry readings and does a little bit of teaching at Amherst. And that pattern just continues. Finally, he moves to a farm in, uh, in, in Vermont and he had two farms in Vermont. He had the farm up on Breadloaf Mountain, up in Ripton, which he had from 18, 1938 till his death in 63. But he also had a, a wonderful farm down near Bennington, Vermont, where he had fruit trees and, and, and he's buried actually in, in Bennington. You can see his gravestone there in the churchyard with his, uh, with his um, gravestone, which reads, I had a lover's quarrel with the world, which is beautiful. And so, uh, you know, Frost, you know, it's, it's, it's astonishing. He said that um, all he ever hoped to do was to lodge five or six poems in the, in the reader's, American reader's memory. And he thought that would be a success. And, you know, you can't even imagine how many, I think Frost wrote, wrote 30 or 40 poems, which are permanent fixtures in American literature. And the great ones being things like The Road Not Taken, Birches, uh, Mending Wall, Death of a Hired Man, um, you know, home burial, um, you know, provide, provide. The great last poem, Directive, where he wanders off into the woods and finds this abandoned house and he sees a little stream and he, with a child's cup there and he says, here are your waters and your watering place. Drink and be whole beyond confusion. I mean, be whole beyond confusion. I mean, he, he sees the part, purpose of poetry pretty much as, Fro as Emerson um, suggests in his great essay, The Poet, is to, create, uh, is, the, is to create a language that's adequate to our experience, to drink and be whole beyond confusion. Poetry is, is spiritual language, which really does heal us and does unify our consciousness. Uh, 
and 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 create a sense of the world that's that's it's that's beautiful and suggestive and um, nuanced. And yet, um, I've also heard you talk about the sound of sense that it's the spiritual level. But he also, uh, when he was in Derry, he'd go to the general store in town. He listened to farmers tell stories, and he saw poetry in their way of talking. To talk, tell yeah, us a little bit about that. He wrote to his friends about. He wrote to one of his students about the sound of sense, a beautiful letter. And he talked about it in his lectures sometimes. He said, well, you know, every, every, every poem is coming out of, of spoken language. And he believed in the speaking voice. And he said, one finds in language itself the harmonies of, 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 of truth. And he said, well, you almost can't get away from it. And he loved listening to the chicken farmers talk at the general store. And his poetry is filled with these voices, you know? Um, it, it's amazing how he could take work with this colloquial syntax and diction and, and create poetry out of the ordinary speaking voice, right? So, so that's very important for Frost. You know, and when uh, you read, I mean, he, he's got that voice when he reads, right? I shall be telling this with a sigh. You can hear him, that speaking voice of the New England farmer, but it's an artifact, you know, Frost, when he was in Oxford and once at high table at an Oxford college with a friend in 1912, he said, one day I'm going to go back to New England and I'm going to become Yankeeer and Yankeeer. <laughs> and he did. He did. <laughs> um, so uh, you've talked a little bit about the relationship or Emerson's influence on Frost, but let's talk a little bit more about Thoreau. Um, you, I mean, he taught him when he was teaching at Pinkerton Academy. Uh, you also write that uh, Frost became a man like Thoreau who could enjoy hours of, quote, congenial and familiar converse with a leopard frog. Um, tell us a little bit more about how you see Thoreau's influence in Frost's uh, poetry. Well, I think, um, so, I mean, if you look at Frost, you've got Frost collected poems, which I almost never have far from me. I've got one set up on my desk here, grade 18, 1949 version. I mean, it's, it's an, a complete guide to the flora and fauna and the people of New England. It's, it's local poetry made universal. And so Frost understood that to go large, to go universal, he had to go small in particular, and he had to get to know the exact nature of New England. And so he was studying not only the, the, the flowers and the trees and the birds and the rocks and the fungus and the kinds of dirt and the rhythms of the agricultural round, but he was studying the kinds of people that lived in that landscape. And his poetry is a marvelously focused concentration on a particular place. And my God, is, uh, is there any more focused book um, than Walden for looking at a particular place? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Thoreau was a great student of the microclimate. And, uh, you know, you could do a wonderful ecological study of Walden and, and see how he was <clears throat> looking at the ecos, the house of nature in this particular place, um, the rhythms of, of the seasons as you move through them, uh, the way he studies the pond itself and the life in the pond, the fish, the way he plants vegetables, his nine bean rows and cultivates them. I mean, Frost was a farmer. I mean, no matter how you cut it, Frost lives on a farm. He was not a great farmer, but he said, I always like to keep a farm in my backyard. And he didn't feel, he felt that, he, if, I mean, there's that great myth of Antaeus in Greek literary mythology. And, uh, and Antaeus derived his strength. He could only be defeated by Hercules if Hercules could somehow prize him loose from the earth. But as long as Antaeus had one foot touching the earth, he had a source of strength. And I think that Thoreau and Frost are two writers that only have their full powers of imagination in, in operation when they're touching the earth. I mean, Frost liked to be out there gardening. So many pictures of Frost clipping rose bushes, and, you know, cultivating his apple trees. And so many of his great poems, one of my favorite of all of his poems is After Apple Picking, which could only have been written by a man who has spent thousands of hours actually picking apples in his own orchard. Um, and, and, and then he sees the symbolic nature of those apples. They're not just apples, they're all the poems, written and unwritten, mostly unwritten. So many of them just falling from the tree, bruised and sent to the, to the cider bin. Um, 
So it's astonishing how he was able to translate the details of farming life into the materials of his poetry and to read, read the, the world of agricultural life in New England, world north of Boston, symbolically. Um, I'll just give you a quote from one of your books and then you can um, uh, riff off it. But in your biography of Frost, you write that Frost's core ideas are in essence romantic, often with an Emersonian tinge, although his natural melancholy and resistance to enthusiasm of a certain kind of a darkening effect on his Emersonian streak. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean, people want to imagine Frost as just this cheerful man walking around um, looking at the cows and so forth and, and, and contemplating his, his uh, flowering tree. <clears throat> but Frost was a man tinged with darkness. He had many unhappy things happen in his life, as did Emerson, as did Thoreau. But um, you know, he was his poetry is suffused with a dark strain. You look at some of these poems, like um, oh, you know, so many of the poems have that just just the, the darkness in them. You can't even get can't get away from it. They're suffused with darkness, and so it's that skeptical strain, the dark strain, that that makes you you know gives sets Frost apart from some of the romantic poets. Um, but by romantic, I mean I'm thinking romantic in in the broader sense here of classical and romantic. And a romantic poet would be one who um, is, is, is just taking reading the natural world for signs of spirit, something like uh, Wordsworth's um, famous poem, Tintern Abbey, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Frost read all of that. But he presents his own natural accent, rhythms, and his own <laughs> natural darkness uh, comes in there. Um. I should remind our viewers that we'll take your questions or comments. And uh, we have a tradition um, for any of you who ask a question at the end, we'll take all the names and we'll pull one out of a hat and we will send you a free copy of Jay's newest book. Um, so we hope that encourage you to ask some questions. Um, Jay, I, I thought you don't have to do this if you don't want, but so many of us in um, high school, and I should say, I think my former high school teacher is watching this evening. Um, yeah. Uh, learn the, law, the wrong lesson from the road less taken in high school. And I, I thought maybe you could help set us straight that that poem is much more complex than kind of your well, you know, adolescent that, reading. The, yeah, the road not taken. I was just recently looking at it again and remembering my own high school teacher, Miss Mayer in Scranton, Pennsylvania. She had those last lines handwritten out and, and framed in a glass picture and up on a butt behind her desk. It says, I took the road less traveled by, and that made all the difference. And she said to us, class, you know, really listen to this poem. I want you to go out there and march to the beat of a different drummer, uh, you know, do your own thing, be an individual. And um, <clears throat> then I started reading the poem. And when you read the poem carefully, um, as I discovered myself as a college student, as I read it very, very carefully, you gotta be so wary of Frost, he's a canny poet. He's out to trick you. And The Road Not Taken is probably one of the most eerily unreliable poems in the English language, in the sense that you can't quite fix its meaning. It's, it's unreliable in the sense that there's no stable interpretation that really will satisfy for very long. I mean, it's a very simple poem. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Everybody knows that kind of image. Got two paths going, one this way, one that way in, in autumn. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Now look what's happening here, second stanza. Then took the other as just as fair. Though as for that, the passing there, emphasize, had warned them really about the same. The third stanza begins, in case you've got any doubt about it, and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. Then he ends with this astonishing ending. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Oh, that's a groan of <laughs> agony. I shall be telling this with a sigh because I know I'm gonna be lying through my teeth somewhere <laughs> ages and ages hence. I'll be saying to my grandchildren, 
as they gather around my knees. I do this. I just had my four grandchildren over last weekend. I said, your grandpappy, <laughs> uh, poet, teacher, I took the road less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. And I'm lying through my teeth. As Frost <laughs> knew he would be lying through his teeth. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I took the road less traveled by, even though I've spent three stanzas telling you that there was no difference between this path and that path. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. So one is not more worn than the other. So it's, it's all about projection of, and self portrait and how we have a strong wish to be seen as an individual, even though we're um, all confronted with choices in life where there's no way we can know which of these paths are gonna work. I was just talking to a student who'd come in this past year advisee and he said, oh, Professor Perini, I'm a freshman at Middlebury and I'm already feeling very uncertain. I said, what are you uncertain about? He said, well, I was accepted at Amherst and I accepted at Middlebury and finally I chose Middlebury and I'm here. But I woke up last night thinking, oh my God, I should have gone to Amherst. I don't really think I'm gonna like it at Middlebury. And he said, what should I do? He said, well, my mother said to me, I called her this morning. She said, Jack, if you want, you can go to Middlebury for one year. And if you don't like it, go to Amherst next year. He said, can I do that? I said, oh, you can do that on some level. But I said, pulled a frost poem off the shelf. And I said, let me read this poem to you. Oh, I kept the first for another day. <laughs> yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I said, yeah, you can't really, you never could, you will never be able to go to Amherst next year as a freshman again. You'll be a sophomore. You'll have different friends. Your people there will have found their friendships in their circles. It's, you know, this is the way life unfolds. And this is what poetry teaches us. It's certainly what Frost teaches us. And it's a hard lesson. And that poem is very complicated. It's got to be read very, very closely and with a great deal of skepticism and openness to the endless possibilities that are in that poem. And I should qualify that it was my error and not understanding the poem, not my former high school teachers <laughs> watching it. I did not mean to besmirch. You um, have to be careful what we say about our teachers. You know, that's right. when, my, when my Frost book came out, I was invited back to um, Scranton, Pennsylvania, because the, to, with, to the dedication of a new art center. And, and they, gave, they, they gave, asked me to give a little talk. And I said, well, I got my start in Scranton when my old ninth grade teacher, Miss Morris, I said, a little old lady with white hair, blue hair, I said, with blue hair, <laughs> insisted, insisted that I read uh, Stopping by Woods in a Snow Evening and write a paper. And that, was, that really got me going. I never liked poetry until I read that poem. And I read that poem and I thought, oh, wow, this is what language can do. And then I saw this little old lady standing up in the audience. I said, you'd like to say something? She said, I was your teacher, Mr. Perini. I was 23 years old. I said, well, I'm sorry. You looked like a little old lady. I always imagined you as a little old lady with blue hair, but now you are the little old lady. But she said, but white hair, not blue. I said, okay. <laughs> We're going to move to questions in a minute, but I thought I might actually ask you a personal question I, I yeah. did read or parts of um, the way of Jesus living a spiritual and ethical life. And you actually talk about Emerson quite a bit in that book. Uh, first, having read his line early in your life that the highest revelation is that God is in every person. Uh, and then I really loved this quote of Emerson's, um, the future state we might imagine is an illusion for the ever present state. It is not the length, but the depth of life that matters. A great integrity makes us immortal, an admiration, a deep love, a strong will arms us above fear. Very Emersonian, my favorite, quite beautiful. My favorite quotation of all time, right? We don't judge our life by its length, but by its depth. And uh, yes, you know, um, the famous um, British critic, Thomas Carlyle, once described Emerson as the aid and a better of all who would live in the spirit. <laughs> 
And I think that the kind of Christianity that ultimately Emerson came to um, propound was a Christianity based on the idea that eternity is now, that the kingdom of heaven is within us, and that this is where we live and find eternal life right now in the present. Time is just an illusion, and in ourselves we find uh, the spiritual ongoingness of resurrection. I mean, uh, so yeah, I, I, in my book, The Way of Jesus, I, I draw on Emerson frequently. Yeah, yeah. I was right. Um, well, let's just uh, allow you to give a plug for Borges and me. Uh, your memoir might just tell us the premise of the of the book. And well, that's a, that's book. my most recent book. It's a, I call it a novelistic memoir or a work of auto fiction. Um, it's a sort of a memoir-ish novel um, based on uh, 50 years ago when I was um, running away from the U.S. I went to Scotland for seven years and did my did two degrees at the University of St. Andrews. And there I met um, a wonderful poet, critic, essayist, Alastair Reed, who was my main mentor, uh, or a, a great mentor and friend, ultimately became a friend of, for my whole life, Alastair. He only died a few years ago at the, almost 90 years old. We never lost touch. Talked on the phone every week for decades. And Alastair was translating two or three great Latin American authors, Neruda, Pablo Neruda, and Jorge Luis Borges, the great Argentine fabulous, fabulous. And at one point, um, Borges came to St. Andrews and uh, to visit Alistair. I was gonna talk about some new translations. And uh, Alistair asked me if I would be Borges' chauffeur. I had a little car and asked me if I'd be the chauffeur while Alistair didn't drive while Borges was there. And so I, in the course of a week, I drove them around here and there including one little trip over to Inverness with Borges. Alice was supposed to go with us, but something happened, he couldn't go. So I drove Borges over there by myself. And so I managed to fabulate, fabul to create um, a, this journey, to recreate it, uh, because Borges made such a profound impression on me. And so it's a memoir of my life at that time, my struggles, my desire to become a writer, my thinking, the work I was doing, the people I met, my, my struggling with my professor, Professor Faulkner, who wanted me to do one thing and that was not what I was trying, wanted to do. Uh, you mentioned that earlier, Tom. I can tell that story if you'd like. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, I mean, I should mention, I mean, it's just a delightful book and it is very funny. I mean, there are parts where I truly did laugh out loud and you're growing up in Scranton. You haven't mentioned that you're, you know, the Biden family were actually your neighbors in Scranton and your immigrant my parents. My mother was or... Joe Biden's babysitter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, but old Professor Faulkner was the head of the English department. He was my PhD supervisor and he was mad as a hatter and uh, he had a big hat and he, he, he very strange man. And um, once after I'd been working with him for maybe two years on my graduate work and he was supervising my thesis, PhD dissertation, he saw me in the quad at St. Andrews and St. Salvator's College. And I can see it like yesterday. And he comes up to me, goes, I say, I say, come here. I said, yes, uh, professor, what can I do for you? He said, ah, he said, listen, young man, I wish you to meet an American like you. He writes poetry. You will get along with him. And he said, why don't you come to tea next Wednesday at my house and I'll introduce you. I said, oh, I'd love that, professor. I'll come. I said, what is this fellow's name? He said, oh, his name, name. His name is Jay Parini. I said, professor, I said, professor I'm Jay Parini. He said, Oh dear, are you? He said, do you have two jackets? <laughs> <laughs> One damn thing after another like that. Well, what, what questions do people have for me? I'd be very happy. Well, we don't to... have as many as I'd like, so people should send them in. So one gentleman writes, as a Harvard sophomore, my friend and I went to Frost's home about every two weeks. I'll always remember that he never recited or read a poem. He always said, let me tell you this one, or did I tell you such and such? He consider them stories. Yeah. That's resonate with you. Yeah, it does. He often would say, I think I'll say this one. He would sometimes use the word say. And then so many of his poems are a little stories, you know. Um, you know, Two Tramps in Mud Time is a tremendous story behind that one. I love it. Mm -hmm. And we welcome other questions. I think I only have one other at the moment. Um, this one, I'm not, again, quite sure it's a question. So this one was interested in, um, uh, again, your interpretation of the poem. Uh, the road not traveled 
It could also be that it made the difference in terms of a choice and the size about not being able to take both roads, i.e. no lie, just a resignation of having to be forced to have chosen between the two. Yeah, that could be. I mean, like I said, the poem is, ne- is, is, is unstable in its meaning. Mm-hmm. Which, which is, is in many ways good because it means one can reread the poem. A poem can never be read, it can only be reread. And I think it's in the reread, that's a good poem anyway. And so I find myself able to reread Frost poems um, con- con- you know, constantly and always finding something fresh and new there. Uh, it's marvelous how that works. Um. People, this, this is pretty far afield, but um, <clears throat> in doing my research for this, I was quite fascinated with your friendship with Gore Vidal. You want to just tell us a, a little bit about how you met Gore Vidal and Gore wrote Vidal. that book. I've written about so many things, but I, re- I wrote a biography of Gore Vidal. It came out about, I think, about 2015. Um, and that was the result of, you know, oh, 35, 40 years ago, I had my first sabbatical. And I took off and I decided, and I, I was studying Italian because my grandparents had Italian connections. And um, so my wife and I were both studying Italian and, and our, our Italian teacher, uh, I said, I want to go to, we want to go and spend some time in um, Italy. And he said, you know, my mother has a house, a little tiny house on a cliff overlooking the sea in Amalfi on the south coast of Italy. And I said, oh, it sounds great. And, he, and so he arranged it for us to go there uh, for the sabbatical year. And um, I discovered that Gore Vidal lived there and I wrote him a little note, gave it to the, I gave it to the um, tobacconist. The tobacconist was a little next door, down the street from our house in Amalfi. And, and when, when you looked up from our terrace, you could see this great palazzo on the hillside clung like a swallow's nest to the cliff massive palazzo. And I said to the backinist, who lives in that great palace? Is there a Duke of Amalfi? Uh, I know the play of the Duchess of Amalfi. And he said, no, no, that's where Gore Vidal lives. And I said, does he ever come down here and mix with the hoi polloi? He said, are you kidding me? He comes every day like clockwork. And he walks by your house. And he comes to me and he buys a newspaper and he goes next door to the Bar Serena and he has a, a drink, maybe two or three maybe 10 or 11 drinks. And then when he can, and at some point he staggers to the bus stop and takes the bus back up to his house. So I said, would you leave a note for him? And he said, yes. And I said, dear Mr. Vidal, I'm a young American writer. I'll be spending the year at uh, number 43 via Torricelli. Um, And if you ever have a chance to feel like um, looking me up, I would love to meet you. And so literally that day, boom, boom, boom knock on my door, Perini, it's Vidal. And so I went with Vidal down to the Bar Serena and we talked until two in the morning about American literature and politics. Uh, Reagan was the president at the time and he was hilarious on Ronald Reagan. You know, he said he reads his speeches with a real sense of discovery. Uh, um, sorry, we have one more question that I'm going to ask you to tell one more story and then I'll close it up. Um, so this individual, uh, I might refashion the question slightly, but if for your students or if, uh, someone wants to introduce a young person to poetry and to the love of poetry, is there a poet you recommend or a book of poems that you think is a, a, you know, a nice entryway into the world of um, poetry? Well, given what we've been talking about today, I would always give someone the selected poems of Robert Frost mm-hmm. because they're so easily accessible and because they sound like poetry, they're in rhyme and meter. And I think that they're a great introduction. Um, there are so many wonderful contemporary poets, you know. Um, the, the recent American Nobel Prize winner, Louise Glick, G-L-U-C-K is, you know, she lives in Cambridge and she's one of the, you know, one of our greatest poets. Yeah, and I would give her give any book of by Louise Gluck to a student as well. I was struck again by this one. It's a series called Poetry for Kids, but you do the introduction and the poems are lovely. And they're ones that I remember learning in elementary school as well as in high school. Yeah, I recently went into a group of, of, of third graders at the local school here, and I gave a talk on Robert Frost and I read several of his poems. And I said, do you have any questions in a little guy raises his hand and he says, yes, I have a question. 
said, what is your question? He said, do you realize that there's hair growing out of your nose? <laughs> so be careful with children. That's quite awful. <laughs> uh, so uh, why don't you close, Jay, with a fun story I've heard you tell before about uh, of <clears throat> reading the Frost did of Fire and Ice and, uh, well, and Fred Loaf. You know, Frost founded the Bread Loaf Writers Conference in 1927 up at Middlebury College here, a beautiful big room there where they would read. It's called the Little Theater. And he would always close the two-week conference with the final reading. He insisted on giving the final reading. And there was always a big crowd standing room only. And he always ended with fire and ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. There was thunderous applause. Frost nodded, blew out through the west doors, walked down the slope and was by a big hedgerow, looking up at the stars and it was the moon that night, smoking a cigarette alone. And this woman, who was a student at Middlebury told me this story years later. She said, I went up to him very frightened and I came near and I said, Mr. Frost, he said, what, what do you want? May I ask you a question, Mr. Frost? A question? Well, all right, what is your question? She said, Mr. Frost, what did you mean by that last poem, Fire and Ice? He said, what did I mean by that poem? Ah. Very simple, very simple, he said. I meant this. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. And he recited the whole poem and then turned his back on her. So that's <laughs> typical Frost. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I want to thank you, Jay, for being here tonight. I want to thank uh, all of our viewers for watching. I mentioned that um, I had worked at the Kennedy Library and I might give the last word to President Kennedy. He invoked, um, uh, well, in the last, visit to Massachusetts um, of his life. He dedicated the library at Amherst College um, in the name of Robert Frost. And he invoked Frost's poem, I have been one acquainted with the night. And then JFK went on to say, because he knew the midnight as well as the high noon, because he understood the ordeal as well as the triumph of the human spirit, Robert Frost gave his age strength with which to overcome despair. So we thank you, Jay, for not only bringing Robert Frost, but Waldo Emerson and Henry Thoreau to life today in a way that gives our age strength during these troubled times. And thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad to be here. And uh, for our viewers, I hope you'll join us again uh, Sunday evening, uh, May 2nd. Uh, I'll be speaking with Anna Malika Tubbs about her new book, The Three Mothers, How the Mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin Shaped a Nation.